Oh, <laughs> fantastic, Dushan. <laughs> and yeah, great, great seeing you all um, again. And thanks so much for joining us for another Dream Destination webinar. Um, for a change, we're actually remaining on the same continent. It's two weeks in a row uh, that we're going to be in South America. This time we're heading just a little further south to the country of Ecuador. And uh, without a doubt, it's one of the most famous bird watching countries on the planet and well regarded as a, a real birding mecca. Today, the focus is going to be on the fabulous Choco Forest region, which is an incredible part of Ecuador, offering a fantastic array of special and sought after species. And to take us there is Dushan. Uh, Dushan has uh, lived in Ecuador now for almost 15 years and he really knows the country in depth. Uh, so having him as our virtual guide today is going to be very special indeed. Uh, Dushan, like so many rock jumper guides, is no stranger to our Dream Destination webinars, having enthralled us with a thoroughly entertaining talk about the Amazon, about the amazing Galapagos Islands in November last year. It's really great to have Dushan back for another talk. And for those of you who don't know who he is, I'll give you a short introduction quickly. Uh, Dushan hails originally from the Netherlands and got into birding at a very young age. Uh, his studies also took place in the Netherlands, where he completed a Master of Science degree specializing in avian research. His studies included projects on extra pair paternity, breeding systems, evolution of song, speciation, and community ecology in countries, including, and, and it's quite a list of countries as well. And um, it was during this field work that he became completely hooked on neotropical biodiversity. And uh, yeah, activities apart from leading bird watching tours for Dushan include scientific research, um, a bit of bird sound recording, and he really enjoys bird photography as well. Dushan is also a member of Ecuador's Rarities Committee. Um, and he has yeah, been a rock jumper tour leader for many, many years now. Um, and then just a quick mention for those of you who might be new to our webinars and not used to the format. Um, at the end of Dusan's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have a question for Dusan, please just post that in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we'll try and get through as many of your questions as possible after the talk. Um, yeah, on that note, the virtual floor is all yours, Dushan. Take us, take us to the Chaco Forest. I certainly will, Keith. Thank you, <laughs> Keith and Nikki. Hello, birders out there in the world. I'm Dushan, and uh, today I'm going to take you to amazing Ecuador again, and this time to the Chocó region. And uh, here we go. So we start once again here with a map of South America, and we go straight to Ecuador, there in the red box. And let's zoom in again. And you might remember I used the same, uh, the same map on the previous talk uh, on Galapagos. And here in orange, we see mainland Ecuador. And Ecuador lies right on the equator line, which is this red dotted line. And it's truly a mega diverse country. It's small but it boosts an amazing uh, 1,719 bird species to date. And this is when following IOC taxonomy. And yeah, one of the reasons for such a small country to be so diverse is explained by the high diversity of different uh, ecosystems. And generally in Ecuador, they divide Ecuador in four major regions. In the east, which we see now in green, they call it uh, the Oriente, eh, the Amazon basin of Ecuador. Then we have um, in, in yellow, La Sierra, eh, the, the, the Andean highlands. This is where the Andean chain goes through the country. And then in the, in the west, we have the Pacific lowlands, which they call La Costa. And the fourth region is the Galapagos, and that uh, was last uh, in November, the webinar. And today we're actually going to uh, visit the heart of the Choco. Right there at the heart, that's where we're going today. And um, here we are. So one of the 
big questions I often get is what is the Choco? And uh, this question has got kind of multiple answers and it's, it's not often um, very clear to define what is the Choco, but let's start here. The Choco is a Colombian department. Uh, here in gray, you can see uh, the department of, uh, of, of the Choco. It's one of the 32 departments that Colombia has. So that's where the original name comes from, from this department. But then uh, the Choco is also considered a biogeographic region. And typically here in green is outlined what most consider the Choco region. Huh? It goes from the Panamanian border in the north all the way down along the Pacific coast of Colombia and Ecuador down to the close to the border of northern Peru. Well, it's also an amazing biodiversity hotspot and uh, bird life uh, considered, it considers this as an endemic bird area, an ABA. And this endemic bird area borders in the north with the Darien uh, ABA, right there in orange. And some people consider this also still part of the Choco ecoregion. And then in the south, it connects with uh, the Tumbesian region, which is here in yellow. So these, eco, uh, these EBAs, they all, all overlap. So there is some species overlap. Um, on this talk, we'll focus on the green part of the map. So another cool... Uh, Detail is the Choco is also one of the, the rainiest places in the planet. And just to give you an idea, uh, some of the pluvial forests uh, along the Pacific slope, they, they get more than 13,000 millimeters of rain per year. And some other so, uh, resources even report like up to 16,000 milli, millimeters a year. So that's, that is a lot of rain. And as you can see in the picture, Always bring an uh, umbrella and rain gear because even in the dry season, you'll probably get a little bit of rain. And uh, yeah, I think this picture was taken in Playa de Oro during uh, some showers. And I, I believe Norma took this picture. So thank you, Norma, for sharing it with me. Then the Choco eh, as a biodiversity hotspot. Um, bird life recognizes at least 63 range restricted birds. And um, this is the largest number of uh, regional endemics of any ABA in Americas. So it's, it's really a very diverse uh, ecoregion. However, sadly, there's also this part of the story. The Choco rainforest and especially the lowlands um, are one of the most threatened habitats on the planet. And um, this is one of the many pictures I can uh, unfortunately share with you. Um, the, the forest is cleared very rapidly. And as you can see, they're uh, planting uh, oil palm plantations but they also plant bananas and, and, and cattle grazing. So deforestation is a, is a major threat and major problem. Um, yeah, I've been back to many places where, where simply the forest was totally gone. Uh, very sad story. Here, uh, another picture. This one I took about 10 years ago. This, this really illustrates how how difficult the problem is. This is uh, at a, a national reserve called Yalare in the far northwest, a place that we do visit on this, on this tour. Um, and as you can see, the, the local authorities have, have placed a, a, a sign, Cuidemos el Bosque, which means uh, we, we, take, we take care of the forest, eh? we protect the forest, but it's not happening. It, the opposite is happening, even though there is signs and even though 
on paper, it's all protected. In reality, it's still being cut down. So uh, this is the sad part of the Choco. And here again on this satellite map here, you can also see the impact of deforestation in Northwest Ecuador. Um, yeah, so the light green areas that you see, especially in the left side corner, that's all deforested. And as you can see in the, let's say in the center of, of this image, it's still dark green. That's kind of the only Choco lowland forest left. And to illustrate where it is, I, I made this darker green um, segment. That's based on this photo and this satellite image is probably quite, quite old. It's from Google. Um, this is the only area with, with pristine choco forest left in Ecuador. I mean, and uh, it's less than 5% of all the choco, Ecuadorian choco lowland forest. And some sources even say it's less than 2% of the original forest that remains. So this is, uh, yeah, this is very worrying. Um, a sad fact uh, regarding the Choco. But let's, uh, let's start on a positive note. There is a way to conserve the last pieces of this pristine forest. And one of the powerful tours is ecotourism. Yeah. Here you can see us in Playa de Oro. And um, by going to these reserves, some of them private, some of them community owned, we generate an income. People do not have to cut down the forest. They can live on, in a sustainable way uh, of the forest. Um, it's such a powerful tool. And it's in, in, in this moment in Ecuador, I believe it's kind of the only tool that will keep those forests alive. So it's time to start the virtual tour to the Choco. I'll be using the same map to uh, outline the, the route. As you can see, a small orangey white dot in the bottom, that's Quito. That's uh, the capital, that's where I am right now. And that's where we start. And from Quito, we travel to the Yanacocha Reserve, which is um, a reserve owned and managed by the Hokotoko Foundation, um, uh, a foundation in Ecuador, the strongest one that has a lot of reserves all over the country, where especially where birders will go because it's where they protect the forests and we'll visit this Hokotoko Reserve, which is just um, northwest of Quito. Uh, you can see now on the map, on the flanks of the Pichincha volcano, that's where we're going to. And this is how it looks like, the Yanacocha Reserve. And this is uh, along the Inca, so-called Inca Trail, and this is the, the view of the Pichincha volcano right in front of us. And um, you could consider this the, the upper, upper part of the Choco forest. Uh, it's a temperate forest ecosystem, so not really uh, tropical Choco, but it's still in the Pacific Slope. So one could say, okay, it, it still covers the Choco region. And here, uh, another view of that beautiful temperate forest on a beautiful day. Sometimes when you go up there, it can be rather cloudy and rainy, but um, the birds will be there no matter what the weather is. And we'll have plenty of targets up there. One of the, the targets there is this beauty. And uh, first of all, it's not a choke endemic, but I had to place it in the, in the presentation. Uh, this is the, the amazing sword-billed hummingbird. It's, um, this is a bird actually with the longest bill of all birds proportionally to its body size. And when we go to Yanacocha, uh, they've got feeders there. And if you're lucky, this, this one comes in. This is a female. And um, yeah, it's an amazing bird. 
So that's one of our targets. And there's plenty of other hummingbirds, including several species of pufflek. This is the sapphire vented pufflek, also not a choke endemic, but this is the one we regularly see. Then um, the one we're always dreaming of is this guy here. This is the black breasted pufflek. So Yanacocha is one of the final refuges of this endemic. It's an Ecuador endemic, only found in, uh, in the Northwest. And you could consider this a, a Choco endemic. Uh, it's extremely rare. Um, we normally do not see it, but we are visiting its, its, its home. So there's always a chance that you lock into it. Then a uh, chestnut named Ampita. Um, this is also a target. It's, uh, the species is not necessarily a choco endemic, but this distinct subspecies obsoleta, that subspecies is uh, re restricted to the choco, to the West Slope. And uh, my friend, Harold Greeny, who, who wrote the book, Ampitas and Net Eaters, he told me that, uh, yeah, the three subspecies of chestnut and pitta very uh, likely deserve a separate species status because even the juveniles of these three are, are different. So further study needed and maybe we'll, we're, we're looking right now at a, at a future split and a chocondemic. There we have a black chested mountain tanager, also not a choke endemic, but um, Yanacoche is definitely one of the best places in the world to see it. This big boy comes, uh, comes to bananas at the reserve, so it's always uh, really nice to see. Okay, so that's Yanacoche, and now we continue to what we call the Mindo region. And we're going down slope, down the west slope into the Mindo region, as you can see on the map. And this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, we're now looking back at the same Pachincha volcano, but at a lower elevation. This photo is taken around 2,000 meters, around 6,000 feet. And it's subtropical forest, and this is definitely considered Choco cloud forest. And here you can see on the same day, similar picture taken. Uh, this is the Mindo Valley and right down in the gap is where you can find the town of Mindo. And uh, we bird along the Nono Mindo road all the way down. And sometimes we get lucky and find things on the road. This is on, on the same Nono Mindo road. We run into a giant earthworm. And luckily our driver Nestor, he he saw it and he didn't drive over it with the car. This is, um, especially when it's raining, these guys sometimes come out on the road. It's a huge earthworm. And you can see a watch uh, laid down on the ground just to indicate how, how big it is. It must have been over a meter for sure. And actually these giant birdworms, if you get really lucky, it's a favorite snack of this beauty. So this here is the plate-built mountain toucan. This is a, a choke endemic, one of my favorites, very colorful toucan and uh, named after, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Named after uh, the, the yellow plate on, on its bill. Let me see, I've got the, I've got the cat here. That... I... So, normally, normally the cat is allowed right here, but I'm afraid she might jump on the keyboard and start doing things. So I had to take her out of the room. So um, back to Play Built Mountain Tupan. Amazing uh, choke endemic, um, high priority target, and usually we uh, we can uh, find one or two of these. Then we have a dusky boost energy. That's, uh, yeah, compared to the previous bird, uh, rather drab, but it's got a nice reddish eye. This is a common uh, choco endemic and therefore also a target. And then this guy, the tanager finch, is 
also a choke endemic, but rare. And uh, we specifically look for this bird in the Bella Vista region um, at an elevation of around 2,300 uh, meters, eh, around 7,000 feet. And uh, yeah, the hit rate is about one in three visits we, we find it, but it can be tough. It, it skulks in the understory of, of tall cloud, um, uh, mature cloud forest and uh, once you find it, I always get excited because it's, yeah, it's a rare bird. It's a beauty. It's a very chunky finch. Um, very special, very special choke on deck. Well, then the, the, the region as well holds a lot of hummingbirds. This is a, a fairly common choke on the violet tilt silk. This is a male, just a spectacular hummingbird. And we have good chances to see this at several different places where they also come to hummingbird feeders. And then the Rufus gaped hill star. Um, this is a hummingbird we don't see that often, but we do try to, to target it if it's around. This uh, used to be considered the white tilt hill star, but recently some authorities have split it into two species. In the west, the rufous gaped hill star, and in the east, the green backed hill star. And thereby, the rufous gaped hill star now officially has become a choco endemic. This is another choco endemic hummingbird. It's actually one of the drabest, but also one of the toughest. It's a hoary puff leg. And as you can see, it hardly has any whitish puffs. But um, yeah, if, if we get a report of, of one being around, we'll, we'll certainly try to target it. Here, yet another uh, much sought after choke endemic. This is the club winged mannequin, a male. And this bird is not flying away. It is actually in this position with his wings folded back making a sound. And it's one of the most amazing bird sounds in the world. Um, it's a mechanical sound. And this bird, if I remember well, uh, its wing movements are the, the fastest of any bird in the planet. Um, it's the same speed of, of some insects. And um, if you wanna know more about this amazing choke endemic, uh, put clubwing mannequin on YouTube and you'll run into various videos and, and documentaries explaining more about this uh, choke endemic. Uh, stunning bird. Then we go to a, to a little more drabber bird, but I love these guys. These, this is a tapaculo, in this case a Nariño tapaculo, also a choke endemic. And uh, normally you hear them and you don't see them. But um, yeah, sometimes they come out. It's, they're like mice. They skulk in the understory and uh, yeah, very difficult to see. Um, once you've seen one tapaculo, you've seen them all. So, and then you can just, if you, more importantly actually is to hear them because their song is very distinctive. This, uh, this bird looks rather scaly because it's a juvenile uh, Narinian tapaculo. And the other tapaculo on this tour that we target is the Choco tapaculo, which is equally difficult to see, but in lower, lower elevations. And then beautiful J, yet another Choco endemic of the, the subtropics in the Andes, a uh, very shy bird. Um, but if we get lucky, uh, we might run into one. Uh, but this definitely not a, not a bird that's guaranteed. We also do owling, and this is the Colombian screech owl. This, uh, this used to be a choke endemic, uh, but many authorities now have lumped it back with rufescent screech owl. So let's say we lost, we win a choke endemic, we, we lose a choke endemic, that's the way it works with taxonomy. Yeah, and this, uh, this, this bird was taken just after dusk. And then when visiting the Mindo region, of course, we have to go to Kilometer 66. That's, many of you might've heard of it, the famous Refugio Pas de las Aves, 
where we will meet Uncle Pass, the Anpita Whisperer. And uh, it started all with this bird. This is Maria, the giant Anpita, a rare, uh, really rare bird, difficult to see, except for at this place where Uncle Pass and his brother Rodrigo have uh, fed it with worms. And now it comes out and actually you can get photos of it. So um, this, uh, this giant anpita is the one of the West Slope. It's a, a subspecies Helodroma, and it's, it's the reddest, uh, quite reddish compared to the one in the East. And this, is, uh, this subspecies is definitely a choke endemic. And then apart from the giant anpita, Angel Pass and his brother sh can show us up to five different anpitas including yellow-breasted anpita, which is also a chocondemic. And this is another anpita at Angel Pass. It's not a chocondemic, but it's one of my favorites, the chestnut crown, beautiful chestnut head, and, and that streaking. I just had to throw in this picture. Not, it's not just all about chocondemics. And of course, when we visit Angel Pass, one of the main attractions is the Andean cock of the rock. He's got a leg of this species. And a leg is kind of a display site where all the males in the morning come together to uh, defend their position in, in the joint leg territory. And um, this is the subspecies uh, that is really blood red. And uh, the blood red subspecies is also restricted to the Choco region. Spectacular bird. Um, need, need to see this, a must see when you visit Ecuador. And then when you're in the height of the Cock of the Rock, sometimes the Choco endemics literally walk into the height. Uh, what you can see here is. We're standing in the background watching the cock of the rocks and suddenly a dark back wood quail just walks into the hide. This is of course, thanks to the magic of Angel Paz who has been feeding it platanitos, bananas. And this is how they uh, look up even closer. Also taken at Angel Paz. Uh, the two birds in the background are actually juveniles. And the one in the front is, uh, either mom or dad. A choco endemic used to be very difficult to see, but thanks to, to Uncle Pass, uh, when they're around, you can get views like this. And then if you're lucky, you might run into surprises as well. This is cloud forest pygmy owl. This is also a choco endemic, a rare one. If you're lucky, uh, you'll get it. It's definitely not guaranteed. Uh, and this is a fairly recently described species. I believe it was officially described in 1999. Okay, so that's the Mindo region, eh? those, those choco endemics. Now we're going to uh, a, another special choco region, which is uh, the Mashpi area and the Amagusa Reserve which is a bit northwest of, uh, of the Mindo region. And this place is, is really stuffed with choco endemics. It's really wet, pluvial uh, cloud forest, uh, which, uh, which explains the presence of all these choco endemics. And this is where you can see the glistening green tanager. Yeah, this, this is one of the brightest green birds on the planet. And every time when I take a photo, it's so difficult with, to, to process the photo because the green is so intense. Yeah, this is the best place. Um, Amagusa Reserve is the best place in the world to see this choke endemic. It's uh, one of my favorites. And also this one is one of my favorites. This is the Mossback Tanager, yet another choke endemic. It's uh, of the genus Banksia. It's a, it's a chunky uh, tanager used to be really, uh, really rare, a rare target in Ecuador. But in Amagusa, they are uh, fairly common actually and easy to see. So uh, we'll definitely be looking for this guy as well, Choco endemic. 
Yet another choke endemic, it rains choke endemics in Amagusa, is the black chint mountain tenature. Uh, it's fairly similar to blue wing mountain tenature, but a little bit deeper orange and blackish chin and a green back. And you might wonder why, why uh, how come I take such good pictures? Well, here is the answer. <laughs> It's not, it's not me, it's, I mean, everybody can do it. Just with the cell phone here. On the right, that's Doris. Doris and Sergio, they, they are the owners of the Amagusa Reserve. It's a, it's a family operated uh, reserve and they have made feeders there and birders come to visit. So by visiting, we, uh, yeah, we protect their forests and it's an amazing place. And as you can see the birds, uh, yeah, the birds can really show themselves well, as does this black chin mountain tanager. Then we have toucan barbet, which also comes there. This is, uh, I call it the clown of the Choco. It's a spectacular bird with many different colors, uh, disproportionately large head. It's, it's a barbet, uh, but a big heavy bill, very cool vocalizations and as well a choco endemic. And we'll have good chances to see this beautiful bird at several different sites and in the Mina region and in the, uh, in the Mashpi area. Um, yeah, great bird, toucan barbet. And of course the area also holds more choco endemic hummingbirds. This is a male purple bib white tip. Yeah, um, it's got this very distinct big post-ocular mark. It's got the purple bib on the chest and then the tip, the white tip is on the tail, not visible here. But uh, if you see it from the back, it's like, like the bird dipped its tail into a, into a white uh, bucket of paint. So this is a choke endemic. And another choke endemic is this guy, the velvet purple coronet. And this is perhaps my personal favorite. Um, this hummingbird, when you see it in the forest, it can look almost black, but suddenly if you get the right light, then the colors transform into this. This image, what you see here is uh, no flash, natural light. It's just the angle of it showing off all those colors. It's stretching. Uh, spectacular colors on this choke endemic. Must see. And Amagusa is a great place to see that. This is another uh, target, also choke endemic, orange breasted fruit eater. Uh, they can hide really well in, in the forest. They're all green and sit still, and you can easily walk by them. But when they call, uh, in this case, it's a male calling, very high pitched. Then, uh, then you can track them down and uh, sometimes they can be showing really showy like, like this, this mill here. Another choke endemic target in, in the Amagusa area is this indigo flower piercer. And you can see the, as a flower piercer, they all has this hook bill hooked at the tip. And yeah, this, this is a, a, a rare bird, very local in Ecuador. But um, yeah, with some effort, we'll, we'll find it. We'll find it at Amagusa. This is yet another target at Amagusa. This is one of the toughies. This is the Choco Birio. Um, compared to the previous ones, a fairly drab bird, but this is often high on the, on the wish list of birders. It's a fairly recently described species. I believe it was described in uh, uh, 96 from, from nearby Colombia, Nariño. And uh, it usually it likes to be high up in the canopy. And if it doesn't vocalize, it's, it's really, really hard to, to see. This bird actually, we played a, a pygmy owl tape of Cloud Forest pygmy owl, uh, whistled it, and suddenly this guy came in. So we were very lucky to, to see it this this well where you can see the wing bars. Yeah, another choco endemic. And as rare as the choco virio or as difficult is this black solitaire. 
yet another choke pandemic. Um, yeah, it's a spectacular bird, but very shy and also a bit seasonal. Um, so you have to be really lucky to, to find one. And, uh, but if you see it, even if you see it flying by, you instantly know what it is. It's an all black bird with conspicuous white in the tail and in the wing when it flies and those white cheek patches. So yeah, our, our hit rate is also about one about three trips. Well, let's say maybe a 65% hit rate on this choke pandemic. And when they vocalize, they can be a little bit easier to see, but they normally do not come in much to playback. This is uh, the Rufus Brown solitaire. It's uh, even rarer in Ecuador than the black solitaire. It's not a choke endemic, but uh, the Amagusa Mashpi area is a good area to look for it. And in Ecuador, it is restricted to the Choco. So this is one of the, the rarest one of, uh, of the region. And if you're lucky, you'll, you'll run into it. Rufus Brown, solitaire, uh, beautiful song, this bird. Okay, so that was, that was Mashpi area in Amagusa. Now we travel to Capari Lodge, which is back a little south to the Rio Blanco. And from the lodge, uh, you, have, you can have this beautiful view of the Rio Blanco Valley. And in this area, we'll, we'll look for uh, specific targets. Um, Pill Manable Arasari, that's, a, that's a, an e usually an easy target at, um, at Capari. Uh, this is often considered an Ecuador endemic, the Pill Manable Arasari, though there, there are a few records of this species in, uh, in northern Peru. When you go further up north, where we're going later, like Playa de Oro, that's, that's where this species is replaced by the stripe-billed Arasari. Very similar, but with a darker bill. And some authorities, they actually lump, lump the, them all as, uh, as colored Arasari. But in this case, following IOC taxonomy, this is, uh, this is an Ecuador endemic and thereby also a Choco endemic with some Tumbesian influence. And the same holds for pellet dove, also restricted to the, to the Pacific lowlands. Uh, Capari is probably one of the easiest places to see. They have a, they have a hide, and from inside the hide you wait and, uh, and pellet doves come out, because usually they're, it's a, quite a shy species. Um, very similar to white-tipped dove, but um, the pellet dove is more reddish-brown on the back and tail, and it's got a whiter breast and a little bit more blue, pale, bluish foreground. Here we got Elvis. Uh, this is the, the long wattled umbrella bird. This is our main target from Capari Lodge. We have nearby an area where we're going to look for it. This is a male and it's a spectacular Cotinga with this long wattle and this Elvis crest. Um, one of the best birds of the Choco, for sure. Uh, not always easy to find, uh, but we have a good spot, and so far we've not missed it. Um, and if you're lucky, you actually get to see them display. Uh, this is a male displaying, and uh, it's just mind-blowing that during display, the whole crest goes completely out, covering the face, the bill, and the wattle is completely extended and opened up. Um, yeah, it's just a bizarre, bizarre world. It's almost uh, alien-like, this bird, when you see it like this. Long wattled umbrella bird, choco endemic. I must see. Okay. And then, uh, when possible, we do also a twitch. If a rare bird shows up, will we have some extra time buffered in to, to go try for it? Here you can see Adam Riley and uh, Matthew Matheson um, and local guide Danilo. They're looking in the understory for a very rare bird at Mashpishungo Reserve. And this very rare bird is this guy, the Rufus crowned ant pitta, choco endemic. Um, yeah. 
the bird that this bird that we watched with Adam actually got in his own name, Shungito, and he has been uh, he was very reliable at the Mashpi Shungo Reserve where we could go and, and see it at close range. Um, but now I don't think Shugito is uh, a regular anymore. I don't think he's, he's, uh, he's being seen for the last few months. But um, as soon as uh, a bird like this shows up in the area, we'll certainly go for it. Uh, I've also seen it in other places like Playa de Oro that we visit. So there's always a chance that you run into it by yourself, but it is, a, it is an extremely rare and secretive bird. It can be considered one of the holy grails of the Choco region. Rufus crowned and pitta or Gnet pitta. Why Gnet pitta? Because uh, recently it has been taken from the ant pittas and placed within the net eater family. Maybe in the future, it, the Pittasoma genus of which there are only two might, uh, might get their own uh, family, um, very special bird, and let's hope we'll get it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that. Now it's time to go to the real hardcore choco, let's say, because no more bird feeders and just tropical lowland forest is where we're going. Rio Canande, also owned and managed by the Hokotoko Foundation, is one of the two prime destinations in the Choco Lowlands where we're going. And you can see on the map, it's, it's significantly further in. Um, unfortunately, the drive through Canande is very sadly, mostly through palm plantations and deforested areas. But once we arrive at Rio Canande, this is what we see. Pristine Choco jungle in hilly terrain, one of the most exciting um, choco forests to bird in. Stuffed with rare birds, literally. And also the more common birds, I have to throw in a few. This is Rufus tilt jacamar. Eh? As soon as you get into the lowlands, you start to see jacamars and trogons, like the, the Western white tilt trogon. Um, and this is also where we start seeing choco trogons. This is choco endemic. This is a male, nice pill eye. Um, some uh, alternative name for this bird is blue tail trogon. And then uh, typically on one of the days at Canande, we walk up to the Mirador, uh, which is the viewpoint. It's a long hike through pristine uh, lower foothill choco forest. Amazing birding, and at the viewpoint itself, which is called the black-tipped Cotinga viewpoint, we look for the black-tipped Cotinga and often get it. This is a, the male is a, an all-white Cotinga that sits in the top of the trees, and you can even find, uh, see it from a very large distance. Well, during the hike up to the Mirador, we sometimes get lucky running into more choco endemic tanagers. Uh, this is the scarlet and white tanager, a really spectacular uh, choco endemic. And this, this guy came low down to feed on, on some fruits. And along the same trail, another choco endemic, golden chested tanager, same genus as the mossback tanager, Banksia, and uh, quite rare. This one is not guaranteed, but uh, we'll definitely look for it in several places. And uh, in this case, uh, I got lucky. It came down and fed on some fruits as well. So uh, then camouflage tactics. So this is, uh, this is right in the Choco jungle. And I usually bring this, uh, or I always bring this uh, camouflage sheet because if you run into rare birds or you hear them or you run into an ant swarm, the birds are shy. So with this sheet, it allows us sometimes to get really good views of the, of the difficult uh, forest dwellers. Um, for example, if you have an ant swarm and from behind the sheet, you can watch all these ant birds uh, coming down 
Um, they feed on, on the insects that are flushed by the army ants. And spotted ant bird is one of the regular attenders there, as well as bicolored ant bird. And if you get lucky with a big ant swarm, uh, yeah, sometimes the oscillated ant bird is around as well. This is, I, you, I love to call it the king of the ant birds because it's big, beautiful scaling on the back and big blue facial skin. And actually this was indeed from behind the blind. It, it came right, landed right on the trail and, and they just feed and you can watch them for, for extended times. Well, with the help of the heart, you can run into other rare choke endemics. This is the indigo crowned quail dove, a beautiful but very shy uh, yeah, dove that, that lives on the forest floor. And nowadays uh, they call it the pur purple quail dove, I think. But uh, I grew since I grew up with Ridgely and Greenfield taxonomy, I I always like the indigo crowned quill dove, the name better. So this is a difficult bird. Kananda is a good place to look for it. Um, and if we get lucky, we actually get views of it. And the same holds for Burlepsius tinamu, another rare forest dweller and choco endemic. Um, yeah, the, this picture is not sharp at all but I did want to include it because there's just very, very little footage of, of this species available. Very difficult to see. We, uh, we often hear it, uh, but seeing it is a different, uh, a different level. We use the, 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 the blind here as well. And when, when, when I took this picture, I remember everybody was on the bird and it was, it was just amazing. The bird came out from the forest and just stood right in front of the trail and we watched it. Great, great bird, Burlepsius tinamu. And then talking about rare birds, here we are. Uh, this is considered the holy grail of the Choco, the rarest bird of them all. It's the banded ground cuckoo, um, very rare bird. Um, you need a lot, a lot, a lot of luck to see it. This is a juvenile at an ant swarm. Uh, the juvenile has a, has a uniform dark crest. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big, like almost pheasant sized cuckoo that mainly runs on the forest floor, very elusive. And Kananda is the best place where we will we'll look for it. Uh, this is what the adult looks like. Uh, the adult has more buffy scaling on the fore forehead. And um, it's got this uh, bright blue facial uh, skin behind, behind the eye. Um, yeah, getting this bird is kind of like a dream come true. If you hit, if you hit a good ant swarm, uh, with lots of ant birds, you always have to wait because this big boy could be around. On the last trip, we were literally this close of seeing banded ground cuckoo. So what happened was uh, we were at Kanande and we went out uh, on a ridge trail with, with local guide Brian, um, who had seen the cuckoo a couple of times on that trail. Um, and we we stopped at a certain place where I thought the understory story looked good for Pitta Soma, the, the Gnet Pitta. So I played, we all lined up carefully and I played the, the Pitta Soma call and we were all watching in the direction, um, nothing happening. And suddenly Brian started tapping on my shoulder and, and I turned around and I said, Brian, what's up? He says, cuckoo, cuckoo. And he was pointing right behind us the banded ground cuckoo had come to check us out, looked at us, Brian saw it. And as soon as we turned back to, to look at it, it ran off. So eventually Brian was the only one who saw it. We spent another three hours waiting and looking for it. Never, never a sniff of the bird. I do remember an indigo crowned quail dove on the trail at that spot was, a, was nice. Uh, yeah. So, great bird, banded ground cuckoo. 
Oh, now we go to the brown-headed spider monkey. So Kanande is not only for birds, but also for, for primates, the, the prime area in the Ecuador and Choco. Um, the last few visits that I've done at Kanande, I've always seen three species of primates, yeah? uh, brown-headed spider monkey, the white-fronted capuchin monkey, and the mantled howler monkey. And the population of primates in Kanande is only growing because it's one of the last places left where they can, where, where they can survive without being hunted, without deforestation. Um, and this population of primates in, in the years really seems to be increasing. So if you want to see monkeys in, in the Ecuadorian Chico, Kanande is, is the place. Um, and as a consequence, one of the birds of the top of the food chain, the harpy eagle, is back. So we all thought that harpy eagle was extinct from the Ecuadorian coast, from the Choco. Eh? More than a decade ago were, were the last sightings. And it was great news and amazing news that in the Tesoro Escondido Reserve, which is a border to Canande, their partners, protecting a larger area together, they found recently a nest, an active nest with two adults and that raised successfully a chick. So on short term, with all those primates around, I'm sure that, uh, that the harp eagle will be seen at Kanande itself because that's where the food is, the harpy will come. So this, is, this shows how important conservation is. Um, the, the top predator is still there. Impressive bird, harpy. And talking about top predators, this is uh, the jaguar, which is also at Kanande and at Playa de Oro. I've never seen one myself in Ecuador, uh, but almost every tip, trip we, we find footprints and uh, the local guides, they, they do see it once in a while. Um, yeah, one of the last places on the Ecuadorian coast where jaguar actually occurs is Canande and Playa de Oro. And another top predator is the Chocoan Bushmaster. This is another very rare um, animal to see. Uh, we got very lucky on, on the Choco trip uh, in two ways. First of all, we, we, saw, we saw it. And second, we, we did not uh, step on it. So uh, now it's an impressive animal, uh, very rare. I've only seen it once. And uh, yeah, it, it was actually on the trail as we walked, it was curled up on the trail and, and we, we saw it and we had to wait for it to move away from the trail. They're not known to be very aggressive, but uh, yeah, um, we need to keep our distance, especially uh, this, this guy was at least three meters. It was huge. Uh, that's about as big as they get, I think. So. Uh, Impressive animal, Chocon Bushmaster. So that was uh, that was Kanande, and uh, just a selection of the things that you can see in Kanande. And from Kanande, we are going to the coast to a site called Las Peñas, and this is where we kind of take a short break of the the hardcore Choco jungle birding, and this is where we do a little bit more wetland and coastal birding. And this is uh, a sleeping site of egrets at Las Peñas, both snowy and great egrets, a beautiful site. And, uh, and it's one of the best places in Ecuador to go look for the pinnated bittern. Uh, this, this bird was photographed there as well. Uh, and sometimes you get lucky and the bitterns walk, walk right, right out in the open. Then uh, targets in that region uh, include the Ocracious Attila. This is a uh, Tumbasian specialty actually, but the Tumbasian endemics, and, uh, they overlap with the Choco and some of them, they go all the way up to here. Uh, one of the best places uh, in the world, I think, to see Ocracious Attila. With um, my last uh, visit there, I counted more than four territories. Um, 
And also Tumbesian uh, endemics like Pacific parrotlet are around. Uh, this is a very small, uh, yeah, like this size, uh, small parrot, parrotlet. And uh, also Tumbesian endemic, but they occur far north and they recently also got into, into Colombia. So it now occurs in Colombia as well. And this is all, all the result of deforestation, massive deforestation of the Ecuadorian coast and Colombian coast and climate change, which kind of transforms the, 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 the wet Chocoan uh, ecosystems into more drier Tumbesian ecosystems. And that's why these, these birds are the ones that are uh, expanding. And if we got time left and there's some good mudflats and things, of course, we have to check for shorebirds. Um, migrant shorebirds. In this case, this is a red knob that I photographed over there. It's a rare migrant to Ecuador. Beautiful, beautiful doe. Many of you will recognize it. Um, and then sometimes, sometimes you get very lucky. Um, this here is a collection of ducks, blue winged teals, white cheek pintails, and a fairly drab duck in the center. That's a southern pochard. And this was uh, photographed at Las Peñas, and it was the first confirmed record in Ecuador since 1956, when a male was collected on the coast. So yeah, it, it definitely pays off to check uh, the wetlands. Uh, so that's what we'll be doing in the Las Peñas area. So from Las Peñas, eh, coastal birding, open habitat birding, we are now going back into the dense choco forest again at our second and last prime site, which is Playa de Oro, the beach of gold. And here we got Jacinto. He just uh, put all the luggage in the canoe because the way, the only way to get to Playa de Oro is by canoe. Uh, this, this is a, a good thing, actually, because the village of Playa de Oro doesn't have any road access, which means that the forest as well stays protected. Uh, you know, as soon as you build in roads, uh, the lumberjackers are tempted to come in with their trucks. But Playa de Oro, the only way to get there by boat, and um, it's an incredible experience. So we're going up the river Santiago, here with Julio. Julio is a, is a good friend of mine and he is, uh, yeah, he's the, the brain behind uh, the ecotourism project of the community of Playa de Oro. Um, thanks to him, uh, all the forest is still around or not just to him, but all his input in bringing in groups and tourists, visiting the place, keeping the forest intact, keeping the forest protected protected. All thanks to, to his inputs. Uh, if you visit the site, you'll definitely meet Julio. Um, and he uh, he's also, for me, one of the best captains on the world, because uh, he navigates over the Rio Santiago, and there's fast currents, and sometimes the, the, the water levels are, are low. But amazingly, Julio always knows, uh, knows his way through this uh, spectacular river on our way in and out Playa de Oro. And there we go. The, the scenery on the Rio Santiago getting into the pristine jungle of Playa de Oro is just, is just amazing. Uh, it, it really gives you a feeling like being in Amazon lowland rainforest, but then you're in the coast. Um, for example, here you can see this is uh, Reserva Tigrillo, where we will be based at Tigrillo Lodge. And uh, here you can see it's just all primarily, primary lowland rainforest. One of the, the last places with such extensive forest in the coast of Ecuador. And um, often we, we, on a day, we go with the boat all the way up into Cotacachi Cayapas National Park, 
where the forest just continues and slowly goes up all the way to the Cotacachi volcano. Spectacular area. And here, once again, this is a view from the Mirador, uh, uh, Mirador Trail, another Mirador Trail that we walk. It's a long trail, excellent birding, um, amazing forest. Yeah. Playa de Oro. And this forest holds amazing birds. This is the scarlet breasted Dechnis, choco endemic. And this is one, actually, one of the most localized choco endemics and an Ecuador specialty. Uh, some of you might know a good friend of mine, Diego Calderon. He is a Colombian birder. And as you know, the choco extends into Colombia, but Diego had to come to Ecuador to see this species because in, apparently in Colombia it's tougher to get. So Ecuador really has the stronghold of this, of this species. They normally are up in the canopy, very colorful, uh, blue with, with red and scarlet. Um, in this case, we were very lucky. It came down to eye level to feed on berries. This is a male. Another beautiful choke endemic is the rose-faced parrots. Uh, we see them both at Rio Canandé Reserve and Playa de Oro. <clears throat> Typically, you see them flying around in small flocks, sometimes bigger flocks, but uh, sometimes you get lucky and they, they might perch and you can see really how nice they are with their rosy-faced parrot. And this is, uh, this is a peek into the primary Choco rainforest of Playa de Oro. Uh, this is Playa de Oro is the lowest elevation forest at around 200 meters, uh, 600 feet uh, elevation that we visit. And especially this area, the lowland, flat lowland rainforest is what the Sapayoa seems to like. So the Sapayoa is uh, it's perhaps not officially choco endemic as it goes a bit into Panama, but it, it, it definitely loves the choco rainforest region, the lowlands. And it's, uh, it's a fairly drab bird, actually. But it's a high profile target because it's placed in its own mono specific family. Yeah. And uh, studies, genetic studies, have shown that this bird is very odd. That's why uh, Enigma is its uh, uh, species name. It's very odd taxonomically because it seems to be more close, more closely related to African broadbills, Asian broadbills and African broadbills. So this is just a lost broadbill in South America. Very special bird. Uh, we'll look for it both at Canandé and at Playa de Oro. Um, and so far at Playa de Oro, I've, I've never missed it. Playa de Oro is the place to see Sapayoa. Yeah. And uh, not to be confused with Sapayoa with another drabby little green bird. This is the green mannequin. And in this case, it's the subspecies Litae, which uh, some refer to as the Choco mannequin. Uh, Richly et al. have already written about it a uh, long time ago. This species probably deserves uh, a separate species status. It, it looks and sounds different from the green mannequin in the east. Um, and it's definitely one of our targets uh, at Playa de Oro and Canande. And this, this poor bird, it, it, was, it was an enhanced one, but you can see it's got some ticks around the eye, actually. Yeah. Five colored barbet. This is uh, another choco endemic and one of Playa de Oro's specialty. Uh, so far, I don't think many of um, there are many records from Canandé, maybe in the lower parts. But at Playa de Oro, this is uh, this is a bird we're looking for. This is a male calling from a Cecropia tree, um, and we usually usually get good views of it. But uh, yes, yeah, sometimes they're up all the way up in the canopy and get pain here looking at it. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great target bird, five-colored barbet. And another Playa d'Oro specialty is the lemon spectacle tanager. Um, yeah, it's a big, chunky, drabby tanager, but it's 
clear yellow eye ring as it skulks with flocks through the, through the mid story and understory, often, often in the same flock as Sapayo. And these guys are pretty noisy, so easy to hear, but uh, sometimes really difficult to see. They're, they're quite shy. Then another prize bird is the Baudo Guan, yet another choco endemic. Uh, this is um, yeah, a, a really rare bird also because of hunting pressure. It's, it's like a crested guan, but smaller. And uh, kind of odd for its behavior is they're not shy at all. Even though they're being hunted for generations by humans, they, once you run into them, they always stay put or they suddenly go quiet and they sit down. You could literally throw a rock at them uh, and, 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 and get one. That's the problem. They are, they are easy to hunt. And for some reason they have remained tame. But luckily at both Playa d'Ora and Rio Canandé, um, they still occur in pretty good numbers. Um, yeah, still a rare bird, um, Pau Doguan. And if you get really lucky, which has happened a few times to me at uh, Playa d'Oro, is uh, you run into the Choco Purwil during the daytime. So they're either on day roost or you find them on their nest. And then patiently, uh, especially when you find them on nest, you just come back carefully and you can watch them. This one was not, a, this was just a day roost, not a nest. And we just got lucky. Uh, we flushed, we flushed one. And a few meters further, it, it sat down on a branch and just showed itself really nicely. And as its name suggests, another regional endemic. And this is also a regional endemic, a small choco screech owl uh, at Playa de Oro, a regular bird that we get to see. We'll try for it at Capari, we'll try for it at Canandé and at Playa de Oro. So we have pretty good, good chances for it, but only, only at night. And then uh, another target bird is the Lita woodpecker. Once again, choco endemic, beautiful woodpecker, with nice markings on the breast. Um, it's named after the town Lita, which is in, also found in Ecuador, will actually drive through the town. Um, and this bird is regular at Canandé and fairly common at Playa d'Oro, but you need to find the mixed species flocks. It moves along with the flocks. And then another target woodpecker is the Choco woodpecker. This one is, uh, is the rarest of the two. Um, it looks a lot like the red rump woodpecker, but it lacks the red rump. It's got uh, denser barring on the, on the under parts, and it's got a very different call. It sounds more like the red stained woodpecker from the east. Uh, this is a poorly known uh, choco endemic. Um, and we can get it both at Playa de Oro, but also en route at the uh, Ava Reserve. Uh, over the years, what I've found out is that this bird specifically likes small palm trees in primary forest. And for some reason, it, it feeds on insects around those palm fruits. So in areas where, where you have lots of small palms within primary forest, do look for this guy, Choco Woodpecker. And then yet another rare uh, Choco endemic, one of the rarest actually, this is the Plumbius Forest Falcon. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a very secretive uh, forest raptor. Uh, this is a juvenile bird. Um, it looks very similar to the barred forest falcon, which is the common one in the Choco. This is the rare one. And uh, the key way to separate it is the tail band. Not visible in this photo though. Uh, the Plumbius forest falcon has a single broad tail band. Uh, furthermore, the call is slightly different, deeper, like lined, colors, lined forest falcon from the east. Typically, the eye could be a bit paler. The facial skin could be a bit redder, but facial skin is not really a good, uh, a good feature to separate the two. The breast markings are a good, good 
feature the, the plumbus force falcon is paler, especially the juveniles are all pale like this one on the breast. Uh, and even the adults have kind of different barring on the, on the underparts. Very rare raptor. So to celebrate all these rare birds of the Choco that we hopefully will see is, uh, this is the Rio Santiago right in front of Tigrillo Lodge where we can enjoy the cold beer and a nice swim. Um, yeah, it's Playa de Oro is just a magical place, magical place. And after Playa de Oro, it's, it's a 15 days tour, two week tour. So after, after the two weeks, we travel back to Quito. It's a, it's a long drive back, but we'll be, we'll be birding en route. And depending on targets that we still need, we'll focus on them. And if time is left in the highlands, we, we typically look for this bird, not an regional endemic, but it's the Ecuadorian rail found on the San Pablo Lake. Um, and uh, I have a little spot where it often shows out in the open. So uh, yeah, I would like to thank you for being on this virtual tour to the Choco. And uh, yeah, I think it's time for, uh, for questions and answers. <laughs> Absolutely, Dusan, yes. Time for question and answers indeed. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Yeah, we'll get into some Q&A shortly with, uh, with Nikki and Dushan. Dushan, that was, uh, that was pretty spectacular. I think you've, uh, what was your, your slideshow? About 100, 100 slides long. I think you've given us 100 fantastic reasons to go and visit uh, the, the Choco in, in Ecuador. It's uh, an amazing part of the world. It looks absolutely spectacular and uh, and those photos are, are pretty unbelievable as well. We've had a, quite a few comments about, about your, uh, your talk already. Thank you so much, Dushan. Thank you, Keith. Um, and then we've also had a few folks, just before we get into, uh, I'm just gonna tell you what uh, next week's uh, webinar is all about and then, and then Q and A. Uh, but we had quite a few of you asking about uh, when our next Choco tour actually is. And we actually have some dates uh, this year, which is in August, so roughly two months time. So. The tour starts on the 25th of August. As Dushan mentioned, it's a 15 day long tour. And uh, there are still a few spots left on, on that trip. So if you are vaccinated, um, yeah, and you're keen for some, some seriously quality birding with, with Dushan out in Ecuador, then, uh, then this is definitely a trip that, that you should be consider or considering. Uh, Ecuador has managed its COVID situation pretty well. And uh, you, can, you can contact our office for more details as well. They'll send you the, the details depending on where you reside. Um, of what the entry requirements are. But for most people, it's pretty straightforward uh, getting in at the moment. Um, so yeah, just yeah, moving then on to, to next week itself. Um, we're gonna be off to a very special and different part of the world. Um, it's a bit of a forest zone and there are some islands involved. It is the Southwest Pacific Islands uh, with Eric Forsyth. So Samoa and Fiji and New Caledonia and Vanuatu are all on the menu. And uh, there's some spectacular birds out in that part of the world as well. Loads of endemics, um, some outrageous fruit doves and uh, other birds like silk tail and azure crested flycatcher and, and a whole bunch more. Uh, the region's probably most well known for, for the kagu, uh, which is a really unique bird and uh, a monotypic uh, family out, out in New Caledonia, endemic to that island. And um, yeah, as mentioned, Eric is going to be taking us on that one. And just so you know as well, for those who are tuned in, you, you will have seen our, uh, our uh, email that went out about the webinar um, yesterday. Um, but yeah, next week it's going to be slightly different times because Eric is based in New Zealand. So that is going to be on Tuesday, July the 6th um, or Wednesday, July the 7th, if you are based out in New Zealand um, or Australia. So it'll be morning of July 7th or otherwise evening afternoon time of July 6th for, for that particular webinar, but you'll get reminders uh, via email as well. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that one. And then obviously the webinars, always we record them, they're available on the website and we'll send you recordings as well if you did happen to, to miss the start of the webinar itself. And um, yeah, finally, if you do wanna donate still to our guides, our GoFundMe link is, is open. Um, 
yeah and on that note nikki over to you and dushan i know there's a bunch of questions oh fantastic oh thank you dushan yeah so first one is from eleanor she's saying uh, what time of the year is the best season to visit uh, presumably in the dry season yeah good good question um so the choco of ecuador we, you could visit it actually all year round uh, because the, the birds are resident um, but indeed, we've got dry seasons and wet seasons, though, um, yeah, I think the best season is indeed August, September, October is when it's kind of dry, but not too dry either, because you do want a bit the rain in there as well for, for bird activity. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say that's, that's in my experience, that's when I've seen most of the, the choke endemics is in, in those months. Um, but um, you, you could try other months as well. I mean, the birds are there. Uh, definitely mm, mm, try to avoid uh, April, May when it's rainiest. I mean, then you can have a trip if you're lucky you'll have an amazing time with lots of birds showing and a little bit of rain during the day but if you're unlucky you could have five days of straight rain yeah. so yeah mm -hmm. well, i hope that answers yeah. the question um cassia says don't forget the fantastic food especially the soups i don't know if you want to talk about what the food is like on, on tour oh absolutely well she's uh, very very Correct. There's one of the reasons why I stayed in Ecuador, because of the Ecuadorian <laughs> soups. Yeah, no, it's uh, in Ecuador, it's tradition to eat soup uh, at least twice a day, once during lunch, once during dinner. And in some places, even you get soup for breakfast as well. And yeah, they've got all these Ecuadorian soups, some with plantains, other with potato and cheese. I mean, I got so used to eating soup here in Ecuador that when I go on tour to other countries, I always complain like, hey, where's the soup? <laughs> so yeah, come to Ecuador just for the soup. Yeah. What, um, what, are, what are the accommodations like on, on these tours? So uh, the Choco tour, uh, our Choco tour is um, sometimes regarded as a little bit off the beaten track but the accommodations are in fact really comfortable. Uh, so in the whole Mindo region, we're staying in top not notch lodges, uh, very comfortable, especially Kapari Lodge is, is a treat. There's a swimming pool and it's like a really nice place to stay. Uh, and then the two remote Choco sites, uh, the prime destination of our is both Kanande and um, Rio Canande and Playa de Oro have, have jungle cabins. It's very comfortable. Um, and in both places, you'll have a, a good mattress with uh, mosquito nets and, and the food. The lodging is very comfortable, but it's, uh, especially at Playa de Oro, it's, it's not like a top-notch lodge, but uh, yeah, I would say you're there for the birds yeah. and uh, the nature and, and people sleep good at no. light or good sleep <laughs> and the lodging is a bit basic but uh, yeah worth it absolutely margaret says beautiful images and lots of other people have as well um Thank you. what is the usual number of species seen on the tour a question from karen okay so this tour karen uh Typically, we, we record between 400 and 450 species. Uh, everything depends a little bit on our efforts on the coast, because on the coast, we can also choose during the heat of the day to, to kind of relax in the hammock and take a swimming pool, or we can try boost the list with more waders, more wetland birds. So depending a little bit on that, typically we record over 400 species. Wow. Yeah. Um, John's asking, which field guides do you recommend? Okay, so in Ecuador, uh, we've got various field guides. I actually forgot to take them all. Let me quickly grab them here. 
So here I've got two, and the other one I can't. So we've got uh, we've got the big Bible, which is uh, by uh, Richley and Greenfield. Um, personally, for me, it's still the best one because mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, it's just a masterpiece, but it's very heavy, very big. Uh, so Lely's uh, came with a smaller version. It's a small field guide, which you can yeah put easily in your pocket. It covers everything, so you have this option. And then you have the the newest one is of Juan Freile. I can't find it, find it, but it's a, it's a good. It's somewhere over here. It's a it's a it's a great book too. It's kind of in between the size of these two, so it depends a little bit also on the artist that you like. Um, so this is this one is done by Miles McMullen. Uh, Robin Restall is the artist of Freile, and then Greenfield is the artist of uh, of this. And uh, yeah, have a look on the internet which plates you like best, and they maybe based on that one you can make your personal choice. Good mm -hmm. advice, thanks, Tisan. Um, Eleanor was saying, what is the altitude? Um, what altitude is uh, Quito? So Quito is uh, the Quito plateau is at uh, twenty eight hundred meters. Let's say around nine thousand feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, Margaret saying um, she considers herself very fortunate uh, to have seen, had seen the banded ground cuckoo. So really cool. Nice. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's, that's very special bird. Well, congratulations, Margaret. Yeah. Uh, Karen's asking how many days is the tour? The tour is, uh, including ar arrival and departure, it's 15 days, one five. Uh -huh. And um, Robert is saying, do we see crested eagles occur uh, at all? On uh, interesting question. So um, literature reports crested eagle in Western Ecuador, but just very few records. And honestly, um, I've only heard rumors. I've never seen any proof of crested eagle in the West. So if they occur, the answer is maybe, uh, but I would like to see pictures because um, so I've seen some pictures of crested eagles in the West and they have turned out to be juvenile black and chestnut eagles. So it's, it's, like, a, it's like the harpy a species that has to be confirmed in recent years. Yeah. Historically, yes, they were around. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, uh, Tristan, saying great uh, webinar. Thanks. Uh, does the reg regular Choco tour, do, the, do you try for the Imperial Snipe at Yana Choco? Ah, okay. <laughs> the Imperial Snipe at Yana Yeah, Yana Kocha. So um, <laughs> that's, some, that's something that we have to pre-organize because the Imperial Snipe, of course, we always try for it. And I've run into it a couple of times during the daytime, but we need to be extremely lucky to find a snipe during daytime. Um, the Imperial Snipe does its display flights in the early morning pre-dawn from, uh, from about October till March. So if the tour falls within those months, you could theoretically go up to Yanacocha and hear them. But then, uh, because you have to be there at 4 a.m. in the morning, you need special permission to, to enter. So it's something that we need, need to pre-organize if people really specifically want to go for that bird. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's uh, where our tailor-made tours department comes in and setting up those bespoke day trips that you want to take on, um, on, on top of a scheduled tour. Um, I've got two questions here um, and um, asking how strenuous is the tour? That's a good question. Um, so this tour is, is not uh, the easiest tour, but it's also not too strenuous, I would say. Um, I always try to have that balance. But for some, for at some sites, especially Canande and Playa del Oro, those are the tough locations. That's where I do want to get up on those Mirador trails, which are up on the ridges. And that is a full day of walking. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, let's say we'll be 10 hours on the feet, but we'll take it slow. We'll take our sticks, we'll take our seats. 
uh, lunch will be carried along. Um, and I know uh, people uh, also from age group 70 and up, many of them actually at the end of the tour said, wow, I'm, I'm feeling fit. All this walking, it wasn't too bad. Um, so if you are not in a great shape, you can still join this trip because what some people decide is if we're going to make a long hike, they can stay around and bird at the launch. Yeah. But I would say this tour is available for most people, even for, for people that are a little less fit, we'll do it. We just take it slow. Mm -hmm. No need to rush, no need to rush on this tour. The birds, literally, it's like a lottery being in the forest. The birds have to come to us. Yes. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, you know, this feeds on to the next question from Frederick. He's saying, is it still fun, even if you're not so educated in birds? Um, I, think it's, I think it's really fun. I, I'll, I'll give an example to Frederick. Once I had... Uh, a person joined a birding tour who was not a birder at all, but a butterfly uh, expert, and he loved it. And yeah, you get to see, literally you get to see parts of Ecuador where no, not many people go. And amazing yeah. habitats, of course. You, you really get a choco culture. Um, I totally forget to, to, to tell it in the talk, but you saw Julio and Jacinto. These are people from African descent. And that province uh, of Ecuador is, is Afro. It's a, it's a specific Choco culture with lots of music, great food. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's really, a, really a special reason to visit that uh, normal tourists often, often skip. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how about uh, speckled, is it uh, speckled bear? No. Spectacle bear. Spectacle bear, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need some spectacles tonight. <laughs> so spectacle bear is, um, I've seen it in the Choco on a couple of occasions, uh, but like with the Imperial Snipe, the best thing to do is to, to come a, a day or two earlier to Quito and we can organize a day trip because uh, nowadays the spectacle bear, I saw one a week ago, right next to Quito, close to the airport, like less than an hour from the airport. Uh, one is hanging around there for, for months. Um, and we have a good communication system between guides. Mm -hmm. We know when a bear is spotted, we can actually go target it. So if you really want to see spectacle bear, probably good to come a few days earlier and we'll, we'll set up a, a twitch as, uh, as I <laughs> like to call it. Twitch the bear. Oh, twitch mm -hmm. the bear. Uh, Pat is saying, uh, what's the hit rate for the black-breasted puffleg? The black-breasted puffleg? Ooh, <laughs> very good question, but I'm not sure if I want to say what the hit rate is. <laughs> this bird, in 15 years, one, five years, so decade and a half, I've only seen it with certainty three times. So once every five years. But um, the best months are right now, uh, June, July, August is when they show up um, coming to flowers. And um, yeah, our tour kind of, especially now with seasons changing, with climate change, I've seen it in August. So there is this slight chance that we might run into one. But it's, it's one of the species I absolutely won't guarantee uh, there's plenty of bird watchers that live here in Quito that have never seen it. I mean, it's almost mythical. It's almost, uh, almost gone, yeah. critically yeah. endangered. Um, uh, thank you. Um, one of the comments here is, thank you for a wonderful webinar, very informative with fantastic photos. Thank you for your kind words. We really appreciate that. Um, last, last question here, because um, we have yeah. run out of time is, Charles is saying, any, is it oddy or oil birds in the region? There is oil birds in the region and we have a site. Uh, typically we visit uh, the site on our regular Choco Cloud Forest tour. That's when it's part of the itinerary. Yeah. Um, and uh, if we have uh, extra time and the whole group is very keen to go for it, we can try to schedule it in. Yes, but it's a little bit of a detour 
uh, but it is possible. Yeah, it is possible to include. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Justin. That was lovely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank absolutely. You, thank you so much, Dusan. Uh, thank yeah. you, everyone, for joining us, folks. Yeah, very special indeed. A lovely, wonderful part of the world. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Nikki. And yeah, to so everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and, and week and what lies ahead. Um, it was wonderful, wonderful seeing you all again. All right. Thanks. Cheers, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hasta luego. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Bye.